thank you for releasing Path of Wellness. We've been playing it uh, a ton and loving it as we have with everything that you have done. Um, I wanted to start off by asking, um, Corin, what is your first memory of Carrie? <laughs> My first memory of Carrie, this is funny because it's come up um, in a couple things we've oh. done this year. Yeah. And I was playing a show. My, my, my first band, Heavens to Betsy, was playing a show in Bellingham, Washington at the Show Off Gallery. And um, I think we played and I was, you know, it was like kind of in the heyday of Riot Girl happening. And there were people asking me questions and there was a journalist there. And so after the show, I was fielding a lot of uh, intense feedback. Let's put it that way. Um, and this girl came up, um, and asked me for more information. And I was like, okay, well, give me your address. And I had my lyric book, my Hemet Betsy lyric book. And I wrote down her name or she wrote down her name and address in the book. And that was Carrie. That is so sweet. More information about what? About Riot Girl. About Riot Girl. And, um, and so like Carrie, what was, what is, what was your first memory then? Well, I had actually seen Corin play in Heavens to Betsy a couple times before that Bellingham show. So Bellingham is a town in uh, Northern Washington, right by the Canadian border. And I was going to college up there, but in high school, I saw Heavens to Betsy play in Seattle. And I think they played with this band called Kill Sybil, which was like a Seattle band at the time. And it was someone's birthday that night. And so Corin saying happy birthday. <laughs> and I remember just thinking, oh, this is my favorite version of happy birthday I've ever <laughs> seen because this person has my favorite voice. And I remember going home and telling my friends about the show and trying to imitate Corin singing happy birthday <laughs> in the Corin Tucker voice. <laughs> <laughs> that is that is so good so then uh, um uh, so corn did you you then reached out and that is is that how it's nope. no. <laughs> not ghosted immediately <laughs> ghosted uh no i ended up so i transferred what corn did say that night and she might not have met, meant it maybe she said this to everyone she said you should you should move to olympia because i said well I, i'm going to western washington but, but i think i'm thinking of transferring colleges. And she's like, yeah, you should go to Evergreen, which is the college in Olympia. And I was like, well, this person told me I should. So I guess I should. <laughs> and you know who wasn't happy about that? My dad. <laughs> <laughs> because he was like, oh, wait a second, what? You're dropping out of college? I said, no, I'm just transferring college. And I did. And if I hadn't, then we would never have formed Slater Kinney. So it's a good thing I, I left and went to Olympia as Corin insisted I do. Mm -hmm. That is absolutely wild one to uh tell somebody that they should move somewhere <laughs> it's just like it's such a big thing to say so to someone but I guess sometimes it's like especially when you're in that stage like you kind of like need that nudge you know yeah, yeah. we were both young I mean I was 18 and corn was 20 that's the kind of stuff you say corn probably wasn't thinking like well she probably will leave <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think that at the time, you know, there was so much like boldness going on, right? Mm. With like this, this scene that we were trying to tackle and make more like, you know, female friendly, make, make more of like space for women. And so it was all about like, you know, reinventing yourself as like this very bold personality, yeah. right? And so I think it came, I came out of that spirit, you know? And when somebody has created such a community and uh, says, be a part of this community or do this thing in order to be a part of it, that I think that just, that's why um, you have been successful and endured because you have created that, you know, that, I mean, that's, that's like a big part of the appeal. Um, so uh, that was great. Thank you. Um, I, I want to talk about path of wellness. Um, uh, what was the, what was the impetus for, for making a new album? How did you come to think, you know, this is the thing that we should do when we were like in 
quarantine and nobody could do anything? Or was it before then? It was both. So we were still technically on the um, Center Won't Hold album touring cycle, which, because that album just came out in 2019. Mm -hmm. And we had finished a European tour, come home right as the pandemic was kind of descending uh, upon the world. But it was those early days where there was still a lot of optimism. People were not sure how long lockdown was going to happen. And everyone thought this will be over by summer. Yeah. Uh, you know, I thought the end of the month we were yeah. like, we had bands <laughs> yes. coming through and they were like, they paused and they were like, Oh, should this band come through? Should we just like wait like two or three weeks? And I was like, yeah, we're going to be, yeah. Just like put it on pause, come back at the end of May. It'll be gone. Exactly. Just, you know, that hot weather burning it off. It's not real, you know, whatever, yeah. but no, I mean, e even those of us who believed in science, assumed it was a fleeting thing. So mm. we still had this tour with Wilco um, in August of last year. And we, we thought it was going to happen. We started thinking about, you know, the center won't hold, hold songs, which had this kind of like corrosive, heavy quality. And then all of a sudden we were going to be playing these outdoor venues under the sun. And we, so we, I don't know, we started crafting songs that had that, that kind of, you know, communal, light feeling in mind. So there was an, a bit of an airy quality to them. They, they felt like they were coming out of more jams and improvisation and just had a looser quality. And then when, of course, that tour was canceled, we still were left with these early songs that did have just, they just were more expansive. So mm -hmm. even though the lyrics started to deal with more what was going on in, in terms of, you know, our lives last year, the music still had this uh, quality that I think stayed on the record, which is just, a, a, you know, a little more, yeah, it's just, it just takes you places. It's, it's kind of its own sort of path. Um, this one, this, this album is the first self-produced one. And uh, did that come out of being uh, self-produced or what did, what did, uh, what did producing your own album uh, teach you? What were like, what was the hardest thing about it? And what was the easiest or most freeing thing about it? Well, I think, you know, <clears throat> producing our own album came out of both being still in a quarantine situation, you know, mm. it'd be like really difficult to bring someone in, but also, you know, being, having the experience of, of making our 10th studio album and feeling like, you know what, I feel like we've got this, like, you know, after we had done totally so true. much work, we'd done so much work back and forth on the songs and, you know, writing all the different parts and arranging everything all, you know, prior to going into the studio. Um, that I think, I think we were really ready for that. And I think, um, you know, I think the easiest part was that Carrie and I really agree on, on music for the most part. Like we, we have very similar taste in things. And so I think we were really able to um, work symbiotically to make something that we're both really excited about. Um, yep. Carrie, I don't know what was the hardest part. What do you think was the hardest part? I mean, I, I think just the, yeah, I don't know. It's hard to, I feel like recording is always a little bit hard, whether you're self-producing or not, you know, there's just yeah. moments of uncertainty and doubt, but I think, I think because we were, we were in our hometown, we don't often record in Portland, actually. It's something we've rarely done. I think, I think only one, one beat was recorded in Portland. And so all hands. Oh, in all hands, but still out of 10 records, that's, you know, a pretty low percentage. So, um, that just creates, it, it's just, it's less, um, stressful, I think, because there's always a time limit when you're traveling, you know, totally. you're just really aware of how much everything is costing. And, you know, you're just like, well, we are, we're leaving here in two days, so we better get this done. And, you know, I do think like limitations are good for the creative process. And so it wasn't like we just hold up in a studio with, you know, endless, you know, free time, or, but we did have that ease of being able to just kind of go in. And if something wasn't firing that on, you know, that day that we knew we could go in the next day and make it work. Totally. Um, uh, 
I I feel like when I was reading about the album, uh, a, like a, a lot of people were saying that the production was like minimal, and uh, I was like. Do you even listen to the first song? It's like I feel like right off the bat, like Path of Wellness has like cowbells and like a bunch of like non-traditional instruments. I'm like, what even are these things? Where it was like, I feel like there was so much going on there. There's like my favorite part is there is like in the middle. I think maybe it happens one time is like a dub, like echoplex kind of like thing that comes in the middle there. What was that about? Yeah, I got, I feel like when you self-produced and minimal just seem to be like two adjectives. An easy thing to put together. Yeah, Yeah. yeah, and I guess coming off the St. Vincent produced album, which certainly was more maximalist and more dense than probably any record aside from The Woods. Um, but yes, thank you. I didn't think it's, I don't think it's that, and it, that minimal. Plus it has instruments we've never used on it. Like, yeah. you know, actual bass. Like we use key, you, we used a lot of synth bass on center won't hold, but um, clavinet, Wurlitzer Rhodes, like a lot of things that just don't exist on, on any other record. So it's, it might be one of our least minimal records. <laughs> That's what yeah. I thought. What, what are some of the instruments in like, just like in a path of wellness, because there are, I felt like there were some weird ones in there. Oh, that's where we had. So, um, our, the drummer on that song, Vince LaRocchi, he had, so he played the traditional drum kit mm-hmm. and then we had him set up a drum kit that emulated like the positioning of regular drums, but with all different, um, percussive elements. So, you know, I think there's just like a wood box on the floor for a kick drum and then like some old like hubcaps and, you know, other sort of metallic objects, uh, in place of like a hi hat and a, you know, a cowbell instead of a snare. And we just kind of had him do polyrhythms over the original drum track. Um, and I think that weird, like echo thing that you hear is, I'm not exactly sure which part you're talking about, but I, I have a feeling it's, it's one of our weird guitar things that just kind of fil- is filtered through an effect sure create something odd but yeah um we were just having fun with the percussive elements on that song and and then we played it a couple times live and of course it's very addictive that polyrhythmic stuff you make fun of it when you're young and you're just watching (laughs) people in a drum circle playing hacky sack and you're like we'll never do that and then (laughs) 20 years later you're just asking someone to do a polyrhythm and saying hey let's let's make this part 10 minutes long (laughs) Oh, that's so good. There was like a part of like I was listening to it and uh, and I was like, it sounds, I was like, I know we were all inside and it looks like someone just went to the kitchen sink and was like, all right, here's a, here's a thing and here's a thing and here's a thing. Like, let's use these. Uh, I love that. In, uh, in Path of Wellness, uh, the line is, I feel like I'm unknown, which to me, I mean, you've both been, you know, you've been a band for a long time and you've done things where uh, I, I would think would make you feel very known. Uh, you've done very personal things. Uh, where does that line come from? I think that, you know, the there's a lot on this album that's looking for connection. Mm. You know, even though, even though, you know, we have been making music for a long time, I think there's always that thirst for connection and for being seen as you really are and, you know, coming out of this really divisive, isolated time in our lives, you know, making music is always about, I think, wanting to be seen and heard. And so, you know, um, I think that's where that line, you know, came from is like, you know, part of, of being on this journey is always over and over again, sort of putting out, putting yourself, your inner self on the outside and, and wanting people to connect with that and, you know, show themselves too as vulnerably as they can. That's so funny. I think of it as the opposite. I think of it as the freedom of redefining of like upending people's expectations. And it's because it's like, and I feel like, and I'm free, like, and I, you know, I feel like I'm unknown. I, I always just thought of it as like, oh, like this, like we, we are in such a hyper attentive 
time and to just sort of have a moment where you're like, no, you don't know me. That to me was that line, but see, we, we are coming at it from two different. I love it. That's, yeah. that's two, two sides. So people can interpret it both ways or some third, fourth or fifth way. Yeah. I think that is like, uh, the beauty of that. Um, I, you know, we've been playing worry, uh, worry with you. Um, and, uh, I think that song and several of the songs, I'm like, this is, a this album is about love more, you know, more than anything else. Like it is a love song, you know, um, uh, do you, do you agree with that? It seems to, it seemed to me to be kind of like fighting against an idea of like sharpness or, um, uh, you know, it, it just kind of at the end, it, 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 to me, it is like, this is a love album about, you know, kind of like being a little softer. Do you agree with that? Um, do you want to answer that one, Corin? <laughs> sure. I mean, I think, I think the answer is yes. You know, I think that, um, I think that this album is, has so much about love on it and it has so much about like, you know, the discovery of who is really important to you and, and what you're willing to go through for that person in, in the kind of like darkest moments that we've lived through, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I think, you know, there is that realization that it's, that relationships aren't perfect and you are going to go through some, some scary and weird things together. And, and that's kind of the, discovering the beauty in that of like, you know, being, being with someone you care about, even when things are very dark or, you know, you both are struggling with things. That's, that's kind of part of it. And there's, there's like a real joy there. Yeah. There's nothing more romantic than sharing a neuroses with someone else. <laughs> <laughs> It is definitely, we only have a handful of love songs and I think that's one of them, but yeah, we, I'm trying to think of, of another one. You have love songs, Corin. you have quarter to three on hot rock. Yeah. Well, even on this album, you know, shadow town is, is kind of like the song about, um, you know, Portland during that time was not only dealing with the pandemic, but we're dealing with, you know, very intense protests for, you know, racial justice and, um, wildfires, you know, like bombs going off downtown. I mean, it was, it's pretty intense. Yeah. And, yeah. um, you know, during that time, my husband was, you know, downtown working as a journalist every day. And so, you know, it, it was, it was literally like, uh, a dangerous situation mm -hmm. every day. And, 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 you know, there's that push and pull of like, you know, this is really important. I want you to do this. This is awful. You know, I'm super worried. You know, can you just come home at the end of it? Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, is shadow town a real place or a metaphor? It's a metaphor. I mean, I think there's so many nicknames for, for Portland. Like we love nicknames, stump towns, city of bridges, <laughs> city of roses, you know, it's, it's been all these different things over the years. And I think that's great. You know, like we're always reinventing ourselves, but I think one of the things about the last year is that it's just that pause gave us the time to look at, you know, um, the problems that we have with injustice in our society and Oregon is, you know, it's, it has a lot of culpability in that as being, you know, a, just a lot of historic racism and, and redlining and, you know, brutality on the, you know, from the police. And, and I think it was just a time of real um, examination of that, you know, so it, it's, it's, it's definitely, you know, changed Portland and changed the way I think we look at ourselves. Um, how, 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 how effective do you think that music is in affecting change? I mean, I feel like it's in terms of, especially with music, but I think it it's true of all art forms. Like it still has to be good. You know what I mean? The songs <laughs> have to be good. Um, the, the, it just, you know, it, they, it's, it's not, it's also 
not a one-to-one sort of equation. You know, it's like art has the ability to be messy and vague and to kind of explore like the unknown to be its own sort of mystery, you know? So I, I think like it's, not necessarily like the only task of art, Mm. you know, is to foment change, but I do think it can provide clarity. Um, it can provide like a fulcrum or, or hope, or just be a soundtrack. But I think, you know, the way that people move through the world, it's hard to know where the certain piece of music is going to meet them in their lives. You know what I mean? Like, yeah it's, it's not always like, Oh, you know, here's this song and that captured the zeitgeist, you know, every once in a while that, that happens, but, you know, things are so kind of subjective and sometimes joy or happiness is its own political act, you know, um, it's its own form of resistance. So, yeah, I think it's, it's complicated, but I, I do think that music is an important element of, of change, you know, and of, of reflecting on who we are, but we're many things. So it's, it's hard to just, you know, narrow in on, you know, the, the political animal, because there's so many other facets of who we are. Totally. Um, uh, I agree. What is, uh, what's next for Slater Kinney? Tour. Tour. (laughs) Are you excited? Yes, I'm excited. I'm also like, <clears throat> you know, it's a little overwhelming to go from zero to 60. Yeah. Of yeah. like, we're stuck in our houses. We don't see anyone. We'll wear a mask, you know? And then, oh my God, there's 10,000 people at the show. And I, I'm like, it's just, it's awesome. It is awesome and overwhelming. Yeah. Also, it's not zero to 60, it's zero to 100. So, yeah. 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 <laughs> I mean, or more. I mean, we're, you know, 60 is slow by today's standards. <laughs> so we we got it. We're hitting the ground running. Um, but no, we're excited, but yeah, it's, I think it's, it's like going to be new for uh, like uh, the audience too. You know, I think there's yeah. a collective excitement and a collective like curiosity about how this is all going to go down. But yeah. I was just watching some of the Euro uh, football <laughs> um, and it was uh, England and Germany and those English fans are just packed into the stadium and, and they're, they're not even doing as well as us, you know, <laughs> supposedly with COVID. So what's, what's a concert, you know, just, uh, <laughs> I went to, I went to like a, a Bucks game and we were at like half capacity and I came home and I had to like lay on the ground for 15 minutes because I was like, that was a lot. That was a lot of stimulus. It was a lot of stuff coming at me. It was like, even leaving, it just like felt like a dream. Um, so yeah, I think it'll be interesting. Um, oh yeah, go go Bucks! Go I Bucks, it, baby! I think it's gonna be Bucks and Suns. Woo! That is that's what I'm hoping. Uh, thank you. I'm going to pull that audio from this and play it uh, on the radio. <laughs> thank you for that drop. <laughs> uh, um, uh, before before we get out here, I would love to know. Uh, one song that each of you have been listening to recently, because I'd love to to come out of this uh, and uh, like on the radio and play a song. So, um, so Corin, you're a DJ on 88.9. What is the next song that you play? I would pick the um, collaboration with Sharon Van Netten and Angel Olsen. Um, <laughs> That's like what I, I was going to say. Sorry, I got there first. And uh, two incredible writers and vocalists combining to something that's like, you know, unique and interesting. And I just, I, I love what they're doing with that song. Um, Carrie, why do you like that song? Uh, it's just, it's not always a sure thing that when two artists come together, we know this, we know this from super groups of your, and it usually doesn't work. (laughs) Yeah. It's, it's, it's not always greater than the sum of its parts, but with Angel and Sharon, it really, what, you know, just a song so suited to, to both of their strengths and they maintain uh, their individuality in the song, but somehow come together to form 
something very magical and the lyrics are great. And yeah, it's just, it's exciting. It kind of, it just makes me think like, oh yeah, you know, I love those, like when it was like Emmy Lou Harris and Dolly Parton and who was, oh, and Linda Ronstadt, you know, I mean, I was like, this is like the next wave of that. Um, anyway, it's just an exciting combination, but I'll also say, um, St. Vincent, who uh, she produced not the most recent record, but our last one. And she also put out a record this year, Daddy's Home. It's a really immense uh, artistic statement and uh, great, great songs on there. And I think the next single is Daddy's Home. So let's play the uh, the title track. Let's do it. Great. Um, uh, that'll be so perfect on the radio. My favorite of the St. Vincent songs is she does one where she kind of like, cribs uh nine to five and, oh no no oh wait it's um it's a uh, morning train the sheena easton yeah maybe yeah, yeah. takes the morning train yeah. oh yes yes i love that one too i was i was listening to that and i talked to her about it and i was like i was listening to the song and i was like this sounds familiar and she was like yeah i got into the studio and i wrote that song and i was like this is the greatest melody that's ever been written and she was like and then i was walking home and i was like oh my god that was sheena easton nine to five <laughs> Yeah. And I think she credits, I think in the she credits, does. she credits. Yeah, no, I, I love it, but that's, that's just how, you know, I feel like, especially for someone like Annie, you know, it's just like music is like a stream. She it's like, and you know, it's like a force to be reckoned with. It's just like, she's dipping into like this sort of collective stream and she's like, Oh, so of course you're going to, it's all going to seep in. Yeah. But yeah. I love that song too. Um, uh, well, thank you both so much. I am in Portland for the next couple of days. Could you each give me a suggestion of one thing to do while I'm here? Is like a bar to go to or a restaurant or one one uh, piece of insider info? I have a couple of restaurant suggestions. Kachka. I went to you- Kachka like three days ago, spent $400 and it was like okay. the best. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I, you're like, I already did that. Um, did you, have you been up to the Rose Garden? No, I would do that. I would go yeah, at night. Room. That would be like so perfect or Mount Tabor, which is sort of the opposite vantage point. So mm-hmm. yeah, Rose Gardens on the West side, Mount Tabor's on the East side. Um, I still love Tusk. Mm-hmm. Oh, my favorite bar. This is just for us. Right. Cause I don't, okay. Yeah. Expatriate. If you head up to 30th Northeast 30th and Killingsworth, there's like a little cluster of great neighborhood bars. There's Wilder, Dame, and Expatriate. And Expatriate has the best drinks in the city. Oh, and go to Eam, E-E-M. That's yes. so good. And also the Grand Stark Hotel is like a really great new hotel. And they have a deli that's great. Like if you want a brunch or breakfast, um, really yummy stuff in there. Love this. Thank you. I can't wait to go and be like, well, I went here because uh, Slater Kimmy told me to go here. So, <laughs> right, well, I'm glad you get some weather that's not record breaking heat. For the next <laughs> yeah, couple days. Yeah, now, it's, now it's just like a Midwestern brutal. summer minus yes. the humidity. Yeah. Yes. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you for releasing the album and continuing to be you and talking to me. So, uh, thank you so much. Thanks, Justin. Thanks. Bye. Bye.